Today's interview is my interview with Alex Bolton. I've known Alex for over about 10 years now, um, back when he was uh, busy being the top of my class at Oxford and I was busy sitting next to him. And um, we were talking when the uh, Philosophy Data Science series first came out. And uh, once again, what really struck me is that Alex immediately knew and really he got the purpose of the series that we were gonna try to be figuring out and discussing some of these uh, philosophical and critical reasoning elements that uh, pervade the practice of data science. Um, so I said, you know, Alex, uh, well, what do you want to talk about? And he said, well, um, we both like anomaly detection. Let's talk about anomaly detection. So here we are, me and Alex Walton, talking about anomaly detection. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to session three of the Philosophy of Data Science series. Today's topic is going to be on change point detection which I think is very interesting, both from a statistical and a scientific perspective. And today we have an expert, someone that I've known all the way back from my Oxford days, Alex Bolton. So uh, Alex, why don't you uh, just introduce yourself and then we'll get on to the, the meat of the issue, which is why change point detection is so cool. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, Glenn. Um, this is a really, I find this a really exciting topic anyway. Um, yeah, so I, um, studied with Glenn at um, Oxford and did an MSc in uh, Applied Statistics. And then I did a PhD at uh, Imperial College London, uh, looking at change point detection and applying that to some cybersecurity scenarios. So one of the applications was related to uh, malware classification. So basically, when a piece of malware is running, um, it will run different types of um, different types of subroutines. So it might do something where it's saying, okay, look for files of some certain type on your machine. And so that will be one, one piece of the running code. And then it might say, okay, try and connect to some server. And then it might say, try and upload this file that we've just found to the server. And so those will be, when it's presented as just machine level instructions, so like do something in memory, do something logical, do something connecting to the internet, um, like there will be clear segmentation of it. Um, and so, yeah, so that, so I was hope using, I collaborated with some people at Los Alamos National Lab in New Mexico, and the aim was to try and improve on the existing like malware reverse engineering um, work that they were doing. Yeah, and I think as a testament to the sort of value of change point detection and understanding this is that, you know, if you look, look at Alex, he uh, previously worked in cybersecurity and now he has moved on to uh, financial analysis compared to myself where I worked in uh, vital sign detection, uh, vital sign monitoring and have it now actually spanned that out to include uh, me medical supply chain modeling that both of us make heavy use of things like step change detection or uh, change point detection because anytime that you're dealing with time series, the vast majority of time series, you're gonna be experiencing these dynamical changes in the data that you're modeling. So, you know, it isn't like, one doesn't simply model a time series. Um, it's much more like um, it's much more like you have a model that's trying to ride on a bucking bronco that is a time series. And it's just the time series, most interesting time series that people are going to sign into and analyze, um, they they defy easy interpretation, which means that the actual modeling process um, is very challenging. So that's why we bring in things like uh, change point detection, step, uh, step change detection, um, uh, non-stationarity and identifying non-stationarity in these models. So I think this is a very interesting idea where even though Alex works in some specific fields, the issues that he's grappling with and contending with are extremely applicable in you know life sciences, finance, uh, technology, pretty much any place where you have time series. And uh, as I like to point out, the vast majority of data is in fact time series. It's just whether or not you actually acknowledge the time series correlation of that. Um, yeah, that's a very nice analogy of the Bronco. Yeah, yeah, it, it honestly does feel like that. Where, um, especially if you look at some of the more uh, erratic changes, um, it's interesting that if you look at 
for example, biology uh, or physiological patient monitoring, where effectively the moment a patient gets sick, their vital signs go from being just sort of a plain old time series to that bronco who's literally trying to throw your model off, you know, off the saddle. And um, also then when you go into these more uh, sort of, I guess, uh, modeling of technical processes where it's sort of computer generated data, um, data generated from computer operations and things like that, those also become very difficult because typically what they have is they might be low noise, but high volatility, which is also a very strange aspect. Um, whereas, you know, looking at many biological processes, you're more accustomed to looking at higher noise levels and maybe a lower form of volatility, where as um, in these more computational processes that produce data, you might actually be looking at, it's precisely this, but it's highly erratic and changing. So you know what the exact value is and it's highly erratic. So it does bring up important sort of philosophical questions about, do I wanna model this as a noise or do I wanna have this highly dynamical changing system to, to uh, try to handle? So yeah. um, maybe, oh, I, I know you you have some, you've pr uh, produced some images for us to sort of walk us through this, but where, where would be a good place to start? Do you maybe wanna just introduce it and I'll pop up the images? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, my basic definition of a change point is something that segments a time series into patterns of behavior, as you've described. Um, so yeah, so here's an example of a time series that undergoes change points. So the first 50 observations are generated from a normal distribution with mean zero, standard deviation one. Then there are 50 from a normal with mean two, same standard deviation. And then 100 observations from a normal with mean minus two. So in this case, it's pretty obvious where the changes are. Um, and as you said, it has this methodology of change point detection has applications in fMRI analysis, a lot of papers from that uh, computer virus detection, econometrics, epidemiology. Um, so yeah, and so I'd like to give a short overview of how inductive reasoning is applied to change point problems. Um, and yes, yeah, so I guess there's three kind of main areas I'd like to talk about. So online change detection, uh, where you monitor a time series and you need to sort of declare if the process has changed behavior. Uh, and also introduce how change point analysis is related to model selection problems. And I'll talk about a couple of inductive methods for determining these change points. Great, yeah. And what, one of the things when Alex and I were talking about this earlier is um, I was really glad when I was talking to Alex because he really got the purpose of this series, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it isn't just to present data science applications. It's to present to the audience how we actually think about these. Because you know you can be shown a million different people applying data science techniques, but unless you actually understand why they chose what they chose and sort of the, the reasoning behind it, you're not going to be able to use what you've learned as well. So the, the idea behind this is like, if you see the thought process behind the analysis, you might be better able to use it in your own work. So I, I, I'm hoping that this is very useful. And I do like very much how um, the, uh, the issue of change point detection, it does bring about many important questions, you know, uh, again, about like whether like, what, what's an inductive aspect of this? What's a deductive aspect of this? How do we model these things when essentially we've already acknowledged that the model itself is changing at different points in time? And so it does bring up the, these different issues. Maybe we should uh, start with the online detection issue because I think that's I think it's very interesting. Can you introduce that to us? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. So uh, yeah, online detection methods are the foundation of the whole field of change detection. Um, so yeah, it all started with statistical process control in the 30s, which is performed in order to ensure that a process is operating as expected. So let me give a simple example. Suppose you want to automate a process that checks the lengths of bolts like this coming off a production line. Uh, and you know that ordinarily the lengths can be modeled as a normal distribution, say, with mean 75 millimeters and standard deviation one millimeter. So roughly 95% of the time, the length will be between 73 and 77 millimeters. So if the length differs from this distribution, then you want to stop production and check what's gone wrong. Otherwise, if you stop production and it's a false alarm, then there will be a cost in the form of lost production and time spent checking the machine. And if you never call an alarm when it has changed, then you'll have this, these worthless bolts um, that are the wrong size. So suppose you're watching this machine generate bolts for some time uh, with mean 75 millimeters and deviation one millimeter. 
then you see the bolts with lengths uh, 76 millimeters, 74.4 millimeters, and then you see 78.5. So that last one is three and a half standard deviations away from the mean, which is certainly an outlier, but the observations immediately before that weren't surprising at all. So it's like, do you stop production now or wait for more data? So the simplest rule is based on constructing a shoe heart chart where you stop production if you see a length that's at least three standard deviations away from the mean. So the average number of bolts produced between false alarms would be 370. And you wouldn't have timely detection of like a small change in the mean or some other changes. But the general inductive reasoning that we want to apply is like once we start observing values that would be unlikely if the process was in control and would be likely if the process was out of control, then we want to trigger an alarm. So there's more powerful ways of applying this reasoning than the Schuart chart. There are several alternatives, but one that's easy to describe is the exponentially weighted moving average chart. So we keep track of the mean as we observe new data, but we give recent data more weight than older data. So if we give all the observations the same weight, then it would take us too long to notice that there's been a change. But if we weight very recent data too heavily, then we're just back at the Schubert chart, where a single high observation causes us to stop production. A uh, common weighting is to use a forgetting factor of 0.25. This makes an easy updating formula for the mean since uh, you could just take the old mean, multiply it by 0.75, and add 0.25 times the new observation to get your new running mean. Um, so you just do update this every observation. Uh, and there's a formula for the standard deviation of this running mean, which depends on the forgetting factor. And a common rule is to stop once the running mean reaches three standard deviations away from the, the control value of the mean, this running mean. Um, so yeah, so in the case I've just described, the average number of bolts between false alarms would be 500 compared to 370 before. Um, yeah, so when I was doing my PhD, my colleague Dean Bodenham was working on an open problem related to the exponentially weighted moving average chart. Suppose we're using an exponentially weighted moving average chart to monitor the mean of some process. Uh, and we want to carry on, even if there are changes, we want to carry on monitoring it. And we want to know that we know that the mean of the process might change abruptly. So what should the forgetting factor be? If we forget quickly, then our estimate of the mean will be unnecessarily noisy when there are no changes happening. But if we forget too slowly, then we'll take too long to adapt to changes. So he applied an adaptive forgetting factor to the problem. And the idea is that you keep track of how well your current estimated mean predicts new data. And if this measure stays consistent, then you just keep forgetting slowly. Uh, but once predictive performance is improved by forgetting quickly, you rapidly increase the forgetting factor, rapidly forget the mean from the old regime, start learn, and then drop the forgetting factor again and start learning the new regime. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I like it because it actually comprises several aspects of just like good bread and butter effective data analysis, um, where mm -hmm. effectively like this uh, exponentially weighted mean, I assume that in the univariate case, essentially, you're only trying to optimize one parameter, maybe one to two parameters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then in maybe a multivariate time series case, you might have uh, one or two parameters per dimension of the time series. Um, and what I think about what's interesting about this is, you know, like, Basically, anyone can implement, um, you know, a weighted average, a moving weighted average. But what makes it a really cool uh, engineering and data science project is the fact that essentially you're tuning that parameter in real time. So you're tracking the data, comparing it, and then making sure that that is optimal, and then deciding an, a strategy on top of that. So a strategy, you, you have your technical challenge, but then you have your strategy on top of that technical challenge about how you deal with the information coming in. So I think that's that that one obviously really applies to me, as you know from my own uh, work, where I definitely try to keep a number of sim keep the model simplistic and then have the control process around it be more sophisticated because I think that that's a bit more interpretable. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more again, it's easier to stay on the bucking bronco <laughs> or the bucking bull, whichever uh, critter that you want to choose. Um, that it's easier to stay in the saddle 
if you keep the model in a simpler way and work on sophisticated ways to control that process. Mm, now, um, yeah, very, yeah, that's very true. So yeah, I, I, those ones always appeal to me where um, effectively you choose a, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be, simple doesn't mean that it's not effective. It simply means that it's easier to control and understand um, and then you can have that sophistication around it. So I, I really, I really like that example. And I think that especially a lot of early career data scientists, when they're looking at, well, how should I be applying things? And it's like, well, I want to apply the newest, most fancy methods. And it's like, yeah, you can try that. But um, at the same time, you know, there's a reason that we are still using methods from the 1950s because yeah, they're- yeah. That's true. So there's, I mean, there's a couple of methods, for example, QSUM, which is uh, cumulative sum charts, are- uh, a bit, you know, the number of slight variations of Q sum charts mm -hmm. is massive. So that's like a huge, there's basically three or four different, slightly different variants of charts. And then all, and then tweaks to those cause, you know, uh, launch a lot of the literature around change point, uh, around online change detection anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I guess just one other uh, quick comment on that is that, you know, when you are using these, uh, even if the actual statistical model of the thing that you're, if your statistical model in the process can be kept simple, but you can also have very sophisticated metrics on top of that. So for example, uh, whether you're looking, when you're trying to measure how novel the time series is, you know, you can be comparing it to several standard deviations um, from an, a normal distribution. Or alternatively, you could say, well, our, actually our distribution is not normal. And you could be making use of, you know, extreme value theorem, fisher tippett type work um, and say, when these things are more abnormal, for example, abnormality, abnormal bolts, you might be more likely to have them be cut too short than cut too long. And so if there is weighting on one side or a heavier tail, then effectively you can be using more sophisticated methods um, or yeah. at least more complex methods. Yeah, absolutely. So well, yeah, one, one of the other charts which has spawned a lot of minor variations is the Shuriya roberts procedure. And that one is really about a uh, sort of uh, inductive reasoning where you may have, but it's especially useful if you have exactly the situation you've described, where you've got some kind of, if it's out, if the process loses control, I think it will look like this. If it's in control, it will look like this. And then you keep taking, you keep calculating the sort of the density of your data under both um, distributions, both in control and what you think it will look like now to control. And if the out of control, the density of, if your likelihood of the data, given the in out of control distribution, it gets much bigger than the likelihood of the data, given that it's in control, then you declare that there's been a change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Actually, yeah, that's that that is uh, that is a good point. I mean, that's basically what I used um, for my okay. snap change detection work for the time series. But um, I think this also brings up a quick point that I'd like to knock out before we go on to your next uh, example, that there's a bit of a, um, the challenge is trying to figure out, like, is this, it shows the squishiness between, for example, some forms of induction versus deductive reasoning when we're working in these data-driven methods. Because the idea is, you know, inductively, you can say, well, we've observed what the normal process is. So looking forward, this is what the normal process is. And I think that's, that, that's pretty straightforward. But the other question is like, well, what about your actual decision process? Is that in fact deductive? You know, saying if it doesn't look like this, if it doesn't look like this reference example, then it doesn't come from a reference example. Therefore, step changes happen. So I think it also shows very nicely that, you know, these aren't cut and dry differences. But the, what's helpful is you need to know where your uncertainty is. Um, you, you need to know that the uncertainty when I'm thinking inductively is the fact that I have used data from this process before, and I'm now trying to apply that to a wider population. Um, whereas the, you know, the deductive component where I'm saying, if A, then B, then C. Um, so, you know, these things aren't clear cut, um, but it does help to sort of generally sort them out in your head so you can make, make progress. Yeah. Cool. So uh, let's look at um, uh, point number two, model selection. Um, I, the, yep. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, so the simplest question for sort of model selection, which is often used in sort of offline change detection, is did a given, given some historical time series, did a given time point correspond to a change point? So here I'm assuming that the time series 
contains at most one change point, which is an assumption that I'll drop later on. So a common data set that's used in change point literature gives the number of UK coal mining disasters in each year from 1851 to 1962. Um, they're not a very jolly chart, um, but we, we can see that disasters were more common in the 1850s. But it is a success story, I suppose. Uh, disasters were more common in the 1850s compared so good to news is coming. Sorry, the good news is coming. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, in the 1850s, coal mining disasters were common. Um, then there was the sort of steady reduction in the annual number of disasters between around 1880 and 1900. Um, and suppose an historian wants to know: Did the 1887 Coal Mines Regulation Act coincide with the reduction in the rate of disasters? So statistically, we reason: Suppose we have two models. Okay, the first has no change points, and the second has a change point in 1887, and the and the time series. There's a different parameter on either side of 1887. So is the model that has two sets of parameters sufficiently better at explaining the data than the simple model to justify having this additional complexity? So the inference here is not too complicated because we've been given the change point 1887 based on the historian's knowledge of the Act of Parliament. Um, it's not something that we're estimating for ourselves from the data. So our simple model is just that each year's number of disasters is a uh, Poisson random variable with a constant parameter over the whole time. And the change point model is that the number of disasters in a year is Poisson with one parameter up to 1887 and a different one after 1887. So if it can be inferred from the data set, um, the inductive reasoning that there is a change point could then be based on this data set, the difference between the, these parameters was estimate in the in the change point model was estimated using say a generalized linear model, and the strong evidence that that difference is not zero. So looking at the data, we will presumably say that the second parameter is lower than the first. I mean, I'm not going to do the analysis for you now, but just by looking at the data, I think it's reasonably clear that there that around 1887 there is a change. It's pretty plausible that there's a change point and the, the rate of disasters uh, decreased. So yeah, basically change point detection in the offline case, I wanna say it's equivalent to a problem with model selection. So in fitting change points to the historic data, we're making a more complicated model, sorry, a more complex model. And obviously we want to do that if there's enough evidence to justify it, but only if there's enough evidence to justify it. Um, yeah, yeah. I really like I I'll, I really like this because also it's the idea that um, I think people get so wrapped up in, for example, getting a model to figure things out for them or getting an algorithm to provide an answer for them that frequently they forget to just look. It's like, okay, what are you trying to identify in this data? Can your own eye see it? And if your own eye can see it, then you sort of you know create the algorithm around that. Um, that's generally the piece of advice that I give people when they're trying to figure out how to construct or select an algorithm um, that mm. just says like, what are you personally trying to figure out? How does your eye see it? Quantify and sort of formalize what your own eye is seeing in this data and, and sort of build a system around that. So I, I, think, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing as well that I guess I do. In my work, I've collaborated with um, cybersecurity experts. But yeah, in this case, I guess I'm trying to, I mean, I don't know if any historian, I'm sure there are historians who are experts on the history of coal mining. Um, but in this case, we're kind of assuming that we've got this expert who's suggesting something to us. Mm -hmm. And then we're, I mean, it's kind of, I guess it's, it's very statistical, you know, stats 101, sort of we're given this nice date, we're given this nice, oh, is it this thing or this thing? Mm -hmm. um, and we can do a hypothesis, we can just do a hypothesis test on this. Whereas I would, in my experience anyway, it's usually the case that we have to, which is given the time series, and then we want to try and work out like a good fit to the model. And we're not going to, we're going to be given, a, we're going to be given information that's like, okay, there, there, we think there's, there are going to be changes here. And 
the changes might take roughly this form X, mm -hmm. um, and then we have to and then we have to go and look for them. You're like this this is like a, a dream situation yeah. compared to what we normally. I mean, it's the same with you that unless yeah. you're physically with the patient as they're you know going through some trauma or something you you're just gonna you're you're just gonna get this time series you're not gonna get annotations from people saying this oh the patient started doing something unusual at this time point your your your, your, your device that's monitoring the patient's vital signs isn't going to get any other data it's just going to have this time series yeah I, I think it's a good point it also it just it's a natural uh it's a natural result from sort of the state of the data science field where effectively we're increasingly be given uh analysis um tasks that haven't been annotated by humans um so the idea that you know some person comes in and saying you know historically there's this piece of legislation passed and i want you to test this difference um those hypotheses effectively have all been either tested or have been considered insufficiently important to be worth testing and things like that. Whereas a lot of the most important ones, it is getting around to saying, um, we just have this data, we know it sort of interacts in this way. It's too large, it's too vast, it's too complex to possibly have a human being spend their time trying to sift through this. And so therefore we need a data scientist to do this or it doesn't get done at all. And I, I think that's an important thing to notice about the field where a lot of the work that we're doing, it is something where it's either if we don't do it, no one else will. And there, and I think that that sort of um, that means that effectively we're a little bit out on the frontier or out alone. We don't have people generating our hypotheses or telling us exactly where to expect things or how to quantify these things. But yeah, we'll I think that's yeah. I, I think that's. I mean, it, yeah, that's definitely a sort of vindication of data science in general that it's just going to. I mean, we've only just started really <laughs> being able to extract, you know, use all the data that's around us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's a pretty vague statement, but but it's uh, true. Well, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the, I, I, I guess I, I've, uh, I've thought a bit about this. And for example, like uh, if you look at, I, I think that um, data science as a career has not, it has been heavily dependent on progress, for example, in software engineering, where um, a lot of the technological boosts created by software engineering um, and the willingness of people to basically generate more electronic data in some way or another um, has then increased the amount of like electronic data, data available. It, we, data science hasn't had such an explosive result because there are more people out in the rainforest measuring you know, uh, poison dart frogs. It's because effectively there are these new ways of um, generating massive amounts of electronic data and that is the stuff that mainly is getting organized. And it's nice that some of these other um, more like traditional data collection techniques and these these uh, fields that are dependent on more traditional data collection techniques have moved along with this uh, type of work um, and also have had a huge history from which we can now draw. But at the same time, there is, there is this element here where a lot of the vastness of the data that we have um, is the result of electronic processes. I think there's also an element where um, it also means that the effect of a data scientist can scale up greatly because effectively their analysis isn't just now for some one-off data set that gets analyzed. It can now then be applied back to the system of mass data collection and analysis. So I think I think there's, there's an element here. And because of that, because it is so massive, it does mean that we're a bit on our own when it comes to analyzing these things. <laughs> Again, okay. yeah, right. I'll, I'll press on with um, this model selection description. Yeah, so instead of assuming that there's uh, at most one change point in the coal mining data per set, um, let's assume that there could be several. Um, so we want to answer the question, you know, how many change points are there in this time series? Um, so you've got, now you've got a set of models. So you've got one with zero change points, one with one change point, and we're not given, we're not told where that is. Uh, one with two change points and so on. Um, so yeah, so I, to me, I think Bayesian statistics is the natural way to use inductive reasoning to compare change point models. So more complex models will fit closer to the data 
they, so you must choose a prior distribution that favors models with fewer change points. Otherwise, you're always going to choose the most complex model. But also, our prior belief is that change points exist but are rare. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a very natural prior distribution for us to use. Um, but then the posterior probability of a model is going to be proportional to its prior probability times its marginal likelihood, which is the likelihood of the data just given the size of the model. So your like likelihood, yeah, probability of data given this many change points. Um, and so you need to integrate out any parameters inside that model. So like the positions of the chain points, the rate of coal mining disasters in each of the different segments. Um, so yeah, to do this for a model with three change points, for example, you would need to compute integrals for all in choose three different ways that you could have three change points. So you can see that this is going to be computationally expensive. Um, so yeah, so one solution is to use a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, suppose you can draw, say, a thousand random samples directly from the posterior distribution of change points. So if the model with one change point has 10% probability, where we've got a 10% chance of choosing a single change point model. And then within that model, if it's really likely that the change point is 1887, then we're really likely to choose that here. So one draw might just have one change point in 1890, and another draw might have no change points at all. Um, you could then estimate the marginal probability of the model with, say, two change points by just seeing what proportion of your samples have exactly two change points. But sampling from this posterior distribution is not simple, but there are some ways that we can approximately do it. Uh, and this is the area that I worked on in my PhD. So the Bayesian method has some other advantages uh, as we can make inference about any quantity of interest related to the change point. So for example, the probability, I might, in my own work, I've, used, I've been interested in things like, what's the probability that two time, two given time points fall within the same segment. So there's no there's no change point between them. Um, but I'd also, um, yeah, I'm, later on I will talk, also talk about a simpler method that tries to approximate uh, the Bayesian posterior model probability. Cool, and so is the online versus offline issue a problem for here? Because as you've mentioned, you know, there is obviously the computational burden. Is this now meaning that we have to move entirely offline or is it that we can, our goal is to keep it online by minimizing the computation or keeping the computation within a certain budget. Yeah, so I mean, I guess some of the methods that I've talked about before for offline are like extremely, um, you they're extremely simple to compute. So in the case of the exponentially weighted moving average chart, we only needed to keep track of one number, mm -hmm. the, run, the running mean that we had. Um, whereas in this case, doing this full computation, thinking about all the different ways that we could segment the past is going to be um, computationally intensive. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean, so it's sort of, I guess, ideally when we're doing it online, having having this sort of uh, ex excellent classification of what happened historically would be really nice to be able to say it's happening in these chunks. Um, and my own research was related to sort of regime detection where you might have behavior A happening, then behavior B, and then go back to behavior A. Um, so if you could set, if you could come up with a really nice segmentation of the past and say, this is, you know, healthy patient, there's something happened, and now we're back to the healthy patient because I learned what that looks like. Um, but yeah, it's simply not, it, it's, it's yeah, not practical. Never that easy or that uh, non-complex. Like I, I think that's one of the most important things to take away from this because this is one of the issues where there are many inextricable components to it, where you don't have a good annotation of the past. There is no thing where you just like learn A and apply to new data and it goes well. It's more like A is super fuzzy, B is super fuzzy, and you don't have all your time that you need to compute on B, and therefore it's try your best and. Um, Again, you just have to try your best I and mean, use your best judgment about what the pri what the ultimate priority of this monitoring task was. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think one of the advantages of the um, 
of having this whole sample from if you if you are able to properly implement the mark the markov chain monte carlo and get these samples of possible changes it's that's also really good and so i guess i mean people have pro i don't know if we're allowed to mention the u.s election that's just happened but um 538 <laughs> i think 538 had a really good demonstration of using this kind of um mark of chain monte carlo in their predictions because they simulated here here are some here's 100 possible elections and then it's saying so you're not it's not like you fix yourself and say here's here's a definitive segmentation of the past mm -hmm. if you're able to use mcmc and draw different distribution different models then you you know you get this ri this really rich view and you're able to say you know this time point say you know what's the prob what this like small time interval what's the probability that there's um you know that there was a change point in that that's going to depend on the the size of the model it might be if we're saying there's one change point then there's basically no chance that there was a change point in 19 uh, 40 or whatever that you know but once you've got say seven change points you might say oh yeah 1940 looking practical looking like looking like that's a realistic change point um but then of course in our coal mining data set having seven change points is going to be like ridiculously unlikely mm -hmm. uh, a priori um and it's going to be sort of overfit um I mean, yeah, and I think that gets back to the idea that, like, using your actual knowledge of the process that generates the data, where um, if you look at coal mining, that there probably is not, um, in the 19th century, a vast number of, uh, like, vast systemic changes. Now, I might be underestimating it. There might have been some, I assume that there's some probably great technological mm. in that time. I just think mm. that they were not such dramatic leaps that it would account for a dramatic change you know, something that would, would be step change detectable versus simply a uh, sort of a change, a slow change in the average. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, I, looked, I looked it up a little bit. There were some, <laughs> there were some acts, uh, several mining acts, but um, yeah, 1887 seems to be one of the definitive ones, which is why I put that in the mouth of a fictional historian saying that that was, that was where the change would be. Yeah. Also, one other thing that I think you brought up that's interesting, uh, I guess, with the uh, 538 and with our own research, um, especially when you're integrating across these things, is that when you integrate across different solutions, the fact is there are correlated errors in much of your measurement process. So to the extent that you say, okay, well, let's now condition on the possibility that I'm wrong. You know, I guess it's the Cromwell, uh, the Cromwell uh, requirement where is consider that you might be wrong, that when you are wrong, that error in that is typically correlated with other measurement errors down the road and other parameterization errors along with it. So when you're considering the moment you're wrong on one parameter, it's typically correlated with uh, other parameters uh, deviating from expectation as well. And so I yeah. think that's one of the important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the model bias, with the um, yes, with the bias of um, pollsters in the U.S. I mean, same in twenty. Uh, 2016 just consistently underestimated Donald Trump's support. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, both uh, both elections. I mean, it was still. I, don't, I mean, 538 just as an example. You know, tried to account for that that, the, that there's you know plenty of uncertainty in this model. Um, Particularly yeah. measurable, like there are certain things that like people have to understand that in data science, there are many things that are effectively, uh, they're, they're unmeasurable in some way that they're inextricably, uh, they're, they're, there is some like irreducible amount of error around them. And I think that we've sort of forgotten the irreducible error aspect when we've been given so much data, but there are things where there are certain uh, they again the generative processes where we can't really get at the fundamental measurement of these things um and yeah. we don't, it's not like we're exactly going down to like string theory or anything like that or like quantum theory to figure out that these things have like irreducible error it's just the, the a large process and still we can only measure it down to a certain uh level of precision yeah yeah i think and the thing is that if you've got um 
biases in your this like uh what was yeah irreducible error was that good yeah if you've got these biases then it can just completely wreck your 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 uh like uh poll of if you were doing a uh, um voting opinion poll you can if you've got some bias where it's like trump voters are even even if it was like half a percent less likely to reply to your survey it can have a dramatic effect on your sample size like huge sample sizes can just be reduced the like you might have a tr- a large like in n you know number of people you've required you've sampled but if you've got some bias in how you're doing in how you're doing the sample then it's like the effective sample you're going to be way overconfident about how good your estimate is you might ask thousands of people and say you know if there's you know p is roughly not probability of voting trump roughly 0.5 you know, I've asked thousands of people and I'm going to have this really narrow error mm-hmm. around what I think the true probability is. But you, if you just have this small bias, it can just be like, actually, you, you think the error is tiny. It's actually massive because yeah. you, you just have this bias that you um, didn't take into account. Yeah, I think also a good biological example is when you look at like, uh, again, vital sign streaming data where uh, there are there are, for example, uh, when you are looking at the uh, sort of the sinusoidal waves in uh, vital sign, which is where vital signs are derived from, that if you miss the periodicity of it, you can very quickly either be either half or double what the actual uh, intended oh, value is. And right. so much data there that you're off by a, by, by a factor. Um, and it's, it's highly dense data. So you're, 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 you're densely wrong. Uh, on that, so I think it's one of those things where you have to be very certain that you have this data and it's correct. But there's also this issue where you need to be looking for evidence that um, that you're in fact off by a factor as well. And it's nice, for example, you can actually see this change point detection in data where you can see the uh, vital sign algorithm. It's tracking the patient along one, uh, thinking, for example, that they're at 60, and it'll jump out to like 120, or it'll jump down to a 30. And the reason is because effectively the algorithm that's calculating, that's uh, doing the signal processing goes off. And now it's off by a factor always going forward. And the data is very dense there. Yeah, like it's not because you're a lack of sampling. It's just that your data generation process has actually um, been, I guess, perverted in some way and or just confused. And so I I think that's something very important to note, especially again, when we are using this uh, electronically generated data or it is a computer generating it. If it does get it wrong, it is typically going to get it wrong in some systematic way. Yeah, no, that's that's fa- that's fascinating. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll carry. I'll finish uh, what I had prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so the the Bayesian information criterion or BIC for short um, that can be calculated for different models to estimate which model is most likely a posteriori. That is given our prior belief that changes are rare and having seen all the data. Um, so the lower the BIC value, the better the model. And the information criterion has two parts. So the first is minus twice the maximized log likelihood. So that's going to give models a low score if they fit the data well. So obviously, fitting the data well is good. Um, and that gives you a low score. And, be, and models with low scores are good. So uh, the second part is the number of parameters in the model um, times the log of the number of data points. So let's say you've got a large number of parameters in your model. You're going to add that on to your, so your, your, penal, your BIC has two parts, minus twice the log likelihood and a penalty for having too many parameters. Um, yeah, so, th- so that's going to offset your BIC score if you overfit. So technically, the BIC needs to be adjusted um, because of the der- because the derivation of it doesn't cover the case of change point model selection. It was um, defined for a, a, a quite a general set of um, quite a general uh, collection of settings, uh, but not change points. Um, but there are tweaks that have been done. For example, in if you just have normal data, um, there's a nice uh, um, tweak which sort of penalizes it for having if your chain points are sort of really close together in parts 
then that's bad. You want you your prior is going to your it's sort of it, it makes sense. But you want your change points to be sort of nicely spread out. Um, yeah. So if the change points were specified in advance, then this adjustment um, for having for estimating the change points um, wouldn't be necessary. But the fact that we have to estimate the change point positions for each model makes the inference more complex. Um, so yeah, so the BIC works best when it's comparing nested models. So for example, if the model with one change point fits best to the data with a change in 1887, and then the model with two change points has a, also has a change in 1887, and let's say another one in 1950. So if the models are describing completely different segmentations, then you would need to see like a big difference in the model's BIC values. Um, to have like enough data um, to sort of inductively conclude that one was better than the other. Um, yeah, and I'll just briefly mention that there is an algorithm called PELT, P-E-L-T, that in the best case will find the set of change points that minimizes the BIC in linear order time, and in the worst case, it will take quadratic time. Um, so still less time than it takes to invert a covariance matrix. That's right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's all set then. <laughs> so it's solved. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that I think that is interesting. Actually, this brings up uh, maybe we should hit that issue, you know, just that that um I think this is this brings up an important point that you know warrants discussion where um we have an algorithm and we say, okay, with that we know that in best case scenario. It works in linear time uh, order time, and worst case scenario, it works in quadratic order time. <clears throat> How do we know that? Well, those are based on mathematical properties, right? So we know deductively that the range is in this area. But the question is for any given data set, how long does it work? And that's not something I think that we can deduce typically. This is, that is something where um, we would actually need to experiment and find out. So, um, you know, where exactly in that range it falls for any given data set. Um, mm. I think that's, uh, that's a pretty interesting issue that I think, um, Alex, maybe, maybe correct me if I'm wrong on that. Usually when I look at these, um, these sort of uh, performance guarantees that minus that the, these are calculated from, we assume a certain number of uh, characteristics about the data and about the model. And then we essentially uh, deduce, given what a best case scenario, worst case scenario is, the data that would essentially create the longest computational mm -hmm. longest algorithm uh, for that. And that's how we come up with these bounds. Is that correct? Yeah. So in the case of PELT, um, deductively, you can say that if you're constantly unsure about the positions of any change points, um, so it's just like it's just really noisy and you never you never you're never able to definitively say, yep, this was a, you know, we saw a huge drop here, this is a change point. We can we can kind of say right there's a post and post and following the yeah, pre and post yeah. change point data set um, then yeah then it's going to take order n squared time to do that and I I played around with um, having with sort of uh, program just use it actually in this for this computational complexity issue. Just using progress bars was actually really useful to see where it was taking a lot of time. Um, and so, yeah, it's basically this exact issue that if there are super, if there are clear segments, then it's just like it, it, it gets, it gets slower and slower as it approaches a change point. And then as soon as it's found a change point, it's like, okay, great. Now I'm basically working from scratch again. I'm looking for change points in this new segment. Um, so yeah, but that's that's an interesting. I think progress bars are underrated, and if you're ever using, if you're ever doing anything to, um, computational, I recommend using them. They can actually be really helpful in debugging, like where your algorithm is taking a lot of time, and yeah, they can sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes you can be surprised by the output that you get from them. That's absolutely true. I'm, I'm going to uh, back that one up again. Um, that, for example, um, when I was doing my um, my uh, Bayesian optimization work to try to optimize these personalized time series models, that what I would do was I would have a constant output. And by constant, I mean this would be say every 
a uh, few minutes for some of these longer tasks. Um, but basically I would have it output where it was in the parameter space um, as it was searching around and what the newest objective function is. And what that gave me a very good intuition for was when was the algorithm jumping around rapidly? So when was it in a massive search uh, versus, uh, sorry, when was a massive exploration phase versus when I go into the exploitation phase and how much each of those mattered. And the reason that then that was doubly beneficial was it gave me a better understanding of where my models were at, at a given time. And so um, mm -hmm. effectively, I was much better at actually tuning my models because I had an intuition about where the model parameters should be at any time. They weren't some abstract numbers for me. I knew very specifically where these ranges were meant to be, and I could better tune to make sure that they were falling within these ranges. So I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to double down on that one. That that's yeah, that's fascinating. That's a really interesting uh, application. I think yeah, it would be especially if we're doing this kind of uh, inference that you were describing where you need to switch between sort of exploration and, you know, checking out lots of different parameters, possibilities, and then exploitation where you think, okay, this parameter is probably in this rough region. Let's just explore very locally. Um, yeah. And it, I think we should, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know good ways of saying it, but you, you would really, if you had a run of, you know, trying to find your best parameter, you would really want some kind of tagging of exploration, exploration, and you would hope to see, I don't know, let's say the first half looks something like loads of exploration, mm -hmm. and the second half looks like loads of exploitation. Yeah. So yeah, that would that more, I mean, again, we, we do have something like that in, um, yeah, in uh, MCMC, where you want to check that the that you're you've kind of convert that you're not that your one thing is that you want to make sure that your estimate of the parameters doesn't just depend on your first guess for them. So you need to check that you uh, that it's gone away from that. But yeah, you also want to check that it's not just sort of wildly jumping around. And if you're not what you're when you terminate, you want to be pretty sure that you're not still wildly searching around. Yeah, uh, unable to find a good. Um, a good uh, a good value for the parameters. Yeah, I guess uh, just one, uh, just to add on to that uh, on the issue of MCMC. So, you know, uh, when you have MCMC, well, we have things like step size. Um, and it's very similar, for example, compared to like simulated annealing, where you have effectively, which is also uh, you govern step size and a rejection criteria. And we can know from the algorithm, and it's very typical to be changing that, uh, that rejection or acceptance cr um, criterion. Um, as the algorithm goes, that so you might want to be more discerning as you go farther on. Um, and there's other things like this too, like for example, Bayesian optimization, where you can effectively change what your objective function is, or you can change what you need to, in order to accept explore versus exploit. Um, but that's just in the algorithm. To get back to your point about you, you need a window into what the actual effect is, and to be tracked in that way, you can have the algorithm say, yeah, be more accepting or be less accepting of um, mm. a new step. But that doesn't, that doesn't necessitate that the algorithm is actually going to be taking bigger or smaller steps. Um, you do need to actually be seeing what is the actual effect of changing this parameter too. So there's two aspects there. One, you know what the uh, algorithm is determined to do by its parameter, uh, by its acceptance parameter. And two, what the actual end result is by which points and which parameters it's actually exploring at that time. Yeah. So it's sort of that two point balancing and you can even think, yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm just repeating myself now, but yeah, you can, you can govern it by the algorithm, but that doesn't guarantee that the algorithm is behaving in the way that you want. So you have to do that double check. Cool. So um, I guess, uh, uh, well, what are, what are some good concluding remarks from this, do you think? Um, right. So, yeah, so for the, let's see, for the online change detection, um, we've seen the application of the sort of general inductive rule. Once we start observing values that would be unlikely if the process was in control and would be more likely if it was out of control and we trigger an alarm. Um, and for offline change detection, um, basically, if you want to test whether a given time corresponds to a change point, the inference is simple compared to testing uh, when you must calculate positions for the change points yourself. So using Bayesian statistics, we can sort of directly quantify our belief from different change point models. 
uh, which I view to be an excellent and exciting piece of inductive reasoning. Um, and although these models are not simple to use when they can be used effectively, they give a rich view of what can be inferred. So from the probability that there is a change point in a given time interval to the expected number of change points. And yeah, but suppose I just choose the change point model with the lowest Bayesian information criterion. This is like computationally feasible to actually get this change point model. And um, yeah, it determines a set of change points that balances the trade-off between fitting the data closely and being a simple model. So yeah, inductive reasoning provides really valuable insights uh, to change point inference. Yeah. So um, yeah, I guess my, my concluding remarks are just uh, several of the following. I think it's worth noting or reiterating how yet again, even though Alex and I work in very different fields, um, uh, very different applications, that we find each other's work interesting because we are still grappling with several of the same problems. One are the technical problems, um, the model selection, the inference around those models, controlling the computational burden of those models. Um, but then there's also just, I guess, the more abstract issue about, you know, how do we go about, you know, selecting or how do we go about valuing certain components of the data, you know, um, where are our priorities going to go? Um, are we going to go and are we going to set our priorities into making sure that we have a really good model through a good inference? Or alternatively, are we going to do it in sort of trying to pre-specify, for example, where some of these change points might be? Um, so trying to get some of that data uh, from, from that perspective. And those are just literally two examples of probably half a dozen things that we could go through right off the top of our heads and say, here are all the different things that you might want to be checking. So it, I think it's it's interesting the way that there is sort of this wild frontier that I feel like we're we're in where nothing nothing is guaranteed. There there are no truly set paths. There's just sort of generally good ideas and less good ideas for how to go about solving these problems. Yeah, excellent description. Yeah, cool. All right, Alex, thank you so much for your time today. I obviously, I really enjoy these types of conversations. I think for a lot of early career data scientists, it's important to hear these types of conversations because um, they might seem a little bit specific, um, but these are the types of uh, problems that data scientists who are practicing in the field contend with. And even though we are in separate areas, we are discussing and trying to get ideas from each other. So I, I think that it's important to see, like Alex has some really important ideas that I'm not going to take and incorporate in my work. And that doesn't mean I'm going to copy his models and try to like take his model and like fit my data into it. It's the idea that I take his priorities in his reasoning process and try to better apply that, take some of my own reasoning blind sides. Uh, everyone has blind sides in their critical thinking process. And I think that it's very useful. I've always enjoyed Alex because of his uh, mathematical rigor. He's a very smart guy. Uh, he's, he's been a bit modest in this. Um, but he is a very well-respected um, uh, statistician in, in his field. And so um, even back when I remember him, back when we were way younger, um, that um, he, he, has a, he has a lot to add to this. And um, he, he has certain, um, how should I put this well? He has a certain focus that I think is very beneficial to compared to how I, how I focus and approach problems. So that's why I like to have these types of conversations because um, it does help turn those ideas and help us refocus and better improve our own blind spots in the analysis process. Well, that's very kind of you, Glenn. Um, and yeah, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah. See you. Hey guys, it's Glenn. Thanks for your time today. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, please consider smashing that like button. It's the single simplest, fastest way to make sure that YouTube shows this video to more people. If you really want to go crazy, consider subscribing or going to our website and joining the mail list. If you want to go totally crazy beyond that, forward this to a friend or colleague who you think might enjoy this too. We're a small channel and every bit helps. Our next episode will be coming out next week. So in the meantime, feel free to look around the channel and see other videos that might be of interest. As a quick disclaimer, the views expressed on the show do not represent anything other than the people saying those words, views, et cetera, like that. It doesn't mean anything about their employers or their employer's views or some thing about their employers or their neighbor's cat or anyone else not saying the words. And in fact, given that people tend to change their views when they're thoughtful enough, it might not even represent the views of the speaker by the time you're hearing the episode. So definitely come back and see if they've changed their views at a later date.
They also don't represent the views of our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. You can check them out on our website.